get the last piece, and then I'm going to start. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now that James, sorry, now that James has his pizza, we can start. <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Rosemary Rochford. Rose did her undergraduate at University of Maryland and then started her PhD here um, with Louis Villarreal and studying the polyoma virus. And then she went with him to the University of California at Irvine to, to finish up, followed by a postdoc at the Scripps Research Institute with Don Mosier, where she learned about EBV-associated lymphomas. Um, next, she went to University of Michigan to be an assistant professor of epidemiology in the School of Public Health. And she started thinking about plasmodium falciferum and malaria. Um, and she also started visiting Kenya and doing host virus interactions in human immunology. So next, she moved to the Department of Micro and Immuno at SUNY Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York. And she rose through the ranks, associate, full, vice chair, and chair of the department. And then in 2015, she joined us here. She stepped down from those administrative positions and she joined us here um, in both immunology micro department and in the um, School of Public Health here. Um, and although we begged her to apply for the open chair position, <laughs> um, she, she's happy doing science for now. So we didn't convince her. Um, Rose has a very nice CV with hundreds of publications and a fully funded lab. And what I like about her is that she's very adventurous, scientifically speaking, and she's happy to try anything new. Today, she will present the talk with the provocative title, Does Malaria Cause Cancer? Oh, well, thank you, everybody, and i um, happy to have a chance to give my first talk here for the Cancer Center um, group, and as you'll see, <clears throat> most people here, I would say, how many people here think about malaria, done much research with malaria? Can you hear me? No? Think about it. How about anybody do research on malaria? Ah, a few here and there. Um, but we don't think about malaria and cancer so much. And so today I'm going to tell you a story, and it begins in Africa and Uganda, and I'm going to see if I can bring it around um, to sort of see if we can answer that question. So <clears throat> the story of, of, of uh, does malaria cause cancer actually starts with this man, Dennis Burkett. Dennis Burkett was a, an Irish surgeon. I always like to say he was Irish because I'm Irish, uh, somewhere in the heritage there. And he trained in London um, back in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s. He was posted down, he became a bush surgeon, he was posted at the Malago Hospital in Kampala, Uganda. Um, that's a picture of the hospital in 2008. I was there with um, the now director, Jackson Oram, and it's, it, you can't quite read it, it says Uganda Cancer Institute. So that's the Cancer Institute there. It's, it's been improved a little bit since then, but essentially it doesn't really look that much different between when Dennis Burkett was there and when we were there in 2008. Dennis Burkett was a curious scientist and a curious physician, and I always like to talk about him because of his curiosity um, opened the door to many area aspects of cancer biology that we know today. But what Dennis Burkett saw when he went then and was posted there is he saw children coming into his clinic that had these very large striking jaw tumors, and they're rapidly growing, and I can tell you they're, they're horrific tumors. Um, this young girl with a jaw tumor here, and a boy with an eye proptosis, they can also be um, abdominal, um, uh, different, they're extranodal tumors. Um, he'd never seen anything like that in his training in England. Um, this is data that we have from Kenya. I'm just showing the, the sort of distribution, age distribution, very rarely before age two, but um, out through age 15, and this peak around at the age of six, which means there's a very short time between 
um, exposure and disease uh, outcome of disease, right? So it gives us a window of time to begin to look at that. So this cancer that is now goes by the name Burkitt's lymphoma is actually found to be associated with, there's three different forms of it, the endemic, the sporadic, and the AIDS associated. Um, they all have a characteristic uh, CMIC translocation, chromosomal translocation. So the CMIC oncogene is translocated onto the immunoglobulin enhancer regulatory, regulatory region, resulting in high levels of expression of, of the CMIC oncogene. This is the first human cancer found to have an oncogene. Um, prior to that, there was those studies in, um, in mice with the SARC and, and rabbits, but this was the first time we found that there was a human oncogene associated with cancer. So all three forms of this have that, but they have different uh, sites of translocation. And what I'm going to be talking about today is the endemic form that we see in Africa. This is a, a pathology picture, and what they classically say is that this lymphoma has a starry sky appearance. These little white spots within the um, uh, histology are actually um, macrophages infiltrating into the tumor, gobbling up the um, dead cells. They have a rapidly growing, they're one of the most fast-growing uh, malignancies as well. So Dennis Burkett, again, coming back to him, he was very curious about this lymphoma that he was observing, trying to figure out. It originally thought it was a sarcoma, became a lymphoma. So he wrote a grant, and he got the equivalent of about 100 U.S. dollars. Woo um, and with that money, um, he distributed flyers throughout clinics throughout Africa and had a, just a drawing of this jaw tumor and asked people, Did you, do you see the tumor? So this isn't any hardcore epidemiology. It's just... Where's the distribution? And this is shown in this map over here. And these black spots represent the sites where people reported cases of the lymphoma. And what you'll notice with this map as well is the shaded red spot is the areas where malaria transmission is what we call holoendemic. So high level of malaria transmission, perennial intense year around the equator actually runs right about through here. So it's an environment that allows malaria to live year round. So when he saw that, he thought perhaps there was a, a, an infectious agent causing cancer. And again, coming back to <clears throat> um, sort of first type things, we knew that there were infectious agents that could cause cancer in mice, rabbits, chickens, so on. But nobody in, in the early 1960s, there was a great debate about whether there was viruses that could cause cancer in humans. So when he showed this um, slide there, he went up and presented this work up in London at St. Mary's, and there was a young cell biologist there by the name of Tony Epstein. Tony Epstein just so happened to have an electron microscope in his lab, of all things, and he set up a collaboration with, with um, Dennis Burkett, and every week they would send up Burkett lymphoma biopsy samples from Kampala up to England, and he would look at them underneath the microscope. Well, <laughs> it wasn't until <clears throat> a few years later I had many, many tries getting at it, that one day the uh, plane was late, the cells were delayed, and um, he looked at them, and the, they looked cloudy and, and contaminated. Um, but what had happened was some of the cells had been disrupted from the tumors, and they were free-floating. He looked at them underneath the scope, and what he saw was Epstein-Barr virus, the virus that now carries his name. This is the first example of B cells, lymphocytes growing in culture, the cell lines, Prior to that, people had only ever grown epithelial cells. He didn't realize as he was trying to culture the t tumor, when he would get these floater cells, he was throwing out so-called so the baby with the bathwater. He was throwing out the floaters. And when he finally started looking at them is when they got more uh, interesting. So he found this virus in the tumor. That's very exciting. Um, and then it started studying where's the virus found. It, and um, we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but 95% of the tumors carry the viral genome in the endemic form. The AIDS and the um, sporadic, sporadic Burkitt's lymphoma is very rarely EBV associated, and it's very rare. Um, the AIDS associated has about a 30% EBV association, but the endemic form, the virus is almost always there. Oops. Um, the other thing is there was an <clears throat> amazing study done in the 1970s in Uganda um, by Guy Dete at the International Agency for Research in Cancer. And they did a study. They did 40,000, sampled 40,000 kids within a region where they knew uh, Burkitt's lymphoma occurred, kept their serum samples, and waited a period of time. And then when the children developed, if there was any children, and it was, turned out there was a few developed Burkitt's lymphoma, they went back and showed that there was antibody titers against EBV that preceded they were elevated prior to the cancer. And lastly, we know that EBV is an oncogenic virus that immortalizes B cells in culture. 
So we have these two pathogens, Burkitt's uh, malaria and um, EBV, and now the question is, how do those two pathogens interact? And when we started working on this, that's what everybody says, well, Burkitt's lymphoma is caused by EBV and malaria, and I found that this very not satisfying answer. Um, but before I get into some of the experiments we've been doing to answer that question, I want to give you a little background on malaria and just a little bit on EBV. So malaria, <clears throat> when we talk about it, it's caused by a pathogen called plasmodium. There's four species that infect humans, um, falciparum, vivax, ovale, malariae, and recently an adventitious one is onotic noelzii, so the fifth one, not very common. Of these, when we talk about <clears throat> malaria in Africa, we're primarily talking about plasmodium falciparum. This is the one that causes the most morbidity and mortality. There's very rarely vivax in, in Africa just because the receptor for that parasite to get into red blood cells is not found uh, commonly in African populations. And this is just data um, looking at percentages. And, and the key point I want you to note, in Africa, um, 174 <clears throat> million cases of malaria. 98% um, are by falciparum, and, and this was, um, the numbers have gone down, but about 600,000 deaths per year. Most of those deaths are in young children. The parasite is transmitted by a mosquito, the Anopheles mosquito. It will never come here. I just was writing to the IACUC because we're doing some experiments. I'm like, there is no Anopheles here, so we don't have to worry about it. Um, <clears throat> but the mosquito transmits the sporozoites. They then infect the liver, so you have a liver stage of infection. And this is the stage it doesn't cause uh, disease. You don't really know you're infected. But when it, the parasite bursts out of the liver cells, it infects the red blood cells and starts a cyclic infection of the red blood cells. And this is when you have the disease associated with malaria. It eventually um, forms gametocytes that get taken up by another mosquito and then uh, continues the, the uh, infectious cycle. During the sexual red blood cell stage of the parasite, a kid that's sick with malaria has 5,000 parasites per microliter of blood is the definition of acute um, malaria. That's a lot of antigen. If you're, if you're an immunologist, you think about how much antigenic burden circulating through the um, host, that's quite a bit. So malaria is associated with a number of different diseases as well. <clears throat> we think about um, the repeated infections generate anemia in these children. That's just the hand of a child an African uh, with dark skin, but anemic, obviously, intellectual and physical growth impairment. You can also get severe malaria, and during severe malaria, the, the, um, uh, you get uh, profound anemia. You can also get cerebral malaria uh, with CNS pathology, coma, and also acute respiratory distress as well. And then finally, you can have death due to plasmodium falciparum. And this is just a, 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 a brain with lots of infected red blood cells in there. So there's three clues that we can think about in terms of um, understanding how malaria might be linked to this children's cancer, Burkitt's lymphoma. First of all, the clinical immunity to malaria. So it's a, I didn't really appreciate this until we started doing the work there, but a child can be infected with malaria um, and develop antibodies. The antibodies will disappear. They get reinfected with malaria and reinfected. So you have repeated infections. And only till they're about the, the age of five or six, the peak age of Burkitt's lymphoma, do they develop immunity to disease. They don't develop immunity to infection, right? But they develop immunity to that serious um, disease. So if they survive childhood um, with that high level of exposure. So you get repeated infections with an antigen that's um, uh, very high level. Um, and it's also linked to impairment of cellular immunity, suppression of T cell responses as well. As I just pointed out, you have this high systemic antigenic burden. P. falciparum DNA com complex with the protohemazone, uh, which is um, a part of a breakdown complex when uh, malaria, the parasite, eats up the heme, heme in a red blood cell. Um, that together is a TLR9 toll-like receptor 9 ligand, right? So it's a pattern recognition receptor. TLR9 is found on B cells. And so we'll come back to that story a little bit later. And then lastly, when we look at P. falciparum, and I said, told you those antibodies go up and they disappear. They go up, they disappear. Um, and there's, it's profound uh, uh, disruptions in B cell biology. And so there's a lot of work um, in the last few years trying to look at what malaria is doing to B cells. But it disrupts the splenic architecture. You can look at uh, children that have died from malaria and, and look at the spleen of those children, and you can see loss of germinal center structure. Um, <clears throat> again, a lot of antigenic burden. The spleen is a site of clearance for damaged red blood cells, so you see a lot of hemozoan. Uh, splenomegaly is quite high there. 
and you get this hypergammaglobulinemia. So that's the malaria side of the story. And EBV is the other side of the story. So EBV is a DNA virus, a gamma herpes virus, a large um, 180,000 uh, base pairs in size. Um, it establishes lifelong latent infection in the humans, and greater than 95% of the population worldwide is infected. So this is where the, the great challenge, when they found the virus EBV in those Burkitt lymphoma cells, they thought that's the answer. And then they found that everybody has the virus, so it wasn't the answer. Um, <clears throat> so that's sort of one of the puzzles is how do you have a virus that infects everybody in the world, but it only emerges to come out disease in different populations. In, in Africa and also in Papua New Guinea where malaria transmission is high, it's linked to Burkitt's lymphoma. In China, um, in a sub-southern China, it's linked to nasopharyngeal carcinoma and epithelial cancer. It's also linked to Hodgkin's lymphoma, a subset to cellular, mixed cellularity, and so on. Um, <clears throat> it's the causative agent of infectious mononucleosis. This is when the infection is not occurring until young childhood, but that's a self-resolving uh, disease. And we know the virus is shed in the saliva. So we, we know a lot about the basic biology, but we still don't know how does it emerge to cause these different types of diseases. So <clears throat> this diagram is a picture of EBV life cycle in B cells. As I said, the virus we know is transmitted through the saliva, but I'm going to show you some data where we think it has other routes of transmission as well, or sources for the host. It gets in through the tonsil. It looks through uh, the, the uh, um, immune cells, the wall dyers ring up in the tonsil, um, transmits there, and infects naive B cells. Those naive B cells express all the viral latent proteins. So EBV is very different from other viruses that you'll study, because most viruses, you put them on cells in culture, and they go lytic, and they make more virus. EBV, when it infects cells in culture, it goes latent immediately, and it drives those cells to expand and proliferate. So the way it makes more infected cells is making those cells divide. We think this is what happens with these naive B cells, and they express, as I said, all these different EBV latent genes, of which one of them, latent membrane protein 1, LMP1, induces it, it actually uh, induces dimethyltransferase, which uh, modifies those cells epigenetically, we think. It then undergoes this transition, and we're not sure what the steps are through that. It's very hard. EBV is a strict human pathogen, so we don't have a way to model this very well. But it infects then the, the, those naive B cells that we think become memory B cells, and then they express only this EBNA1 protein. And the EBNA1 protein ties that viral episome to the cellular chromosomal machinery. It does many other things, but when that cell divides, the EBNA1 makes sure that the, the ep viral episome is dividing too. In the peripheral blood, then, you can detect the virus in memory B cells. It's very rare. And this is data from uh, David Thorley Lawson's group at Tufts. And what he's focused on is how I call it the healthy U.S. adult model, because those working on people that work in his lab. Um, the frequency of virally infected cells is 1 in 100,000 B cells, he estimates, are about EBV positive. So very rare. It can be there. You can find the antibody. But if I were just to take a small blood sample for most everybody in this room that's EBV infected, it would be hard for me to do it unless I took a lot of blood to get enough B cells to do that study. We also know, <clears throat> and this is work that we did way back when, uh, and other people have done as well, that when EBV uh, <clears throat> undergoes lytic reactivation, uh, it goes from a memory B cell and terminal differentiation to a plasma cell, the virus reactivates, makes more virus, and makes the lytic proteins, and we think then this starts the cycle to infect more naive cells and then shed into the saliva. So we've got a very complicated life cycle. Most of what we know is by studies of, of US adults where they're very healthy, and the frequency of infected cells is very low. So back to the question. We now know a little bit more about malaria, a little bit more about EBV, so how are they going to interact to increase that risk for Burkitt's lymphoma? Well, there's a couple of clues, and these are two papers that came out, one by um, a group, <laughs> as I said, that the Plasmodium falciparum um, DNA is a toll-like receptor ligand. So that's number one. That's actually, uh, you can't, malaria parasite component. And then down here uh, from a group in Sweden, Marie Therese Berhano's group, showed that uh, if you take malaria-infected red blood cells and mix them with a Burkitt lymphoma cell line, it can induce those viruses to reactivate. So we sort of said, well, if EBV and malaria interact, maybe they induce viral reactivation would be one mechanism, so driving that terminal differentiation. Or because of the TLR9 ligand, we know that if you uh, tickle B cells with a TLR9 ligand, you can drive them to proliferate and expand. 
and therefore increase the number of latently infected memory B cells. <coughs> so our research that we, we wanted to tackle this question um, is in Kenya, and we took advantage of the fact that in Kenya you have very different um, uh, elevations. The, the um, Great Rift Valley goes right through Kenya, and so you have uh, the highlands of Kenya where the weather is actually quite lovely and blue skies, um, but it gets cooler nights and mosquitoes can't live you around there. And so you have malaria, but on occasion. Um, and then the lowlands of Kenya on Lake Victoria where the malaria transmission is year round and intense. And we had actually done a study um, with one of my students, who was an epidemiology student, and mapped out two regions in Kisumu where the malaria transmission is high, and then up on the highlands about a two hour drive, depending on the roads, um, where malaria transmission is low. We also show that there's very little Burkitt lymphoma where there's mal low malaria transmission and very high Burkitt lymphoma. So these populations are at high risk for Burkitt lymphoma and low risk. So what we did is we just did a cross-sectional study. We took blood um, uh, <clears throat> cross-sectionally from kids one to four, five to nine, and 10 to 14 years of age. Um, and we were looking at that age group because thinking about this um, malaria immunology Right? So the malaria parasite, you start getting immunity to disease at about the age of five uh, years of age. And this is, um, <clears throat> we did whole blood, so we did it by quantitative PCR. Um, and what we found, this is a log scale. So the, at the one to four year olds, the children from um, Kisumu were uh, uh, quite high viral load compared to the kids um, from Nandi. So three logs difference in terms of amount of viral load in the peripheral blood. We then did, this my student Eric Wolford did a limiting dilution PCR on a subset of, of samples. And just um, essentially what you do is you take the PBMCs and we didn't have much samples so we're working with um, blood from little, little guys so it's not like you can get your 60 to 100 mils of blood out and do all kinds of stuff. We have two to three mils we're usually working with. And um, what you can do is then <coughs> um, do serial dilutions into a, a 96 well plate so you have 100, uh, like a million, 100,000, 10,000, 1,000, and so on, and then extract the DNA in the plate and then quantify um, the frequency of latently infected cells based on this limiting dilution. You do a Poisson distribution analysis. And what he figured out was that it was one in, in 10,000 PBMCs were infected with EBV. And thinking about that relative to, sorry, um, <clears throat> The U.S. adults, it's about a hundredfold higher than what you see in the U.S. population. And these are healthy kids. These aren't, these aren't sick kids. These were actually all very healthy um, children. So we wanted to next ask the question, um, if the viral load, we're looking at this point in time here, sort of at age between one and four, and it's so strikingly different, how did it get to be that different? So we had a couple different models, but it said we had to go backwards in time and age to see what happened. When you do a cross-sectional study, you don't know how the kids got to where they were when you're doing that analysis. So we set up a study where we um, followed the kids again in Kisumu, where there's a lot of malaria, and Nandi, where there's very little malaria. And we enrolled a number of, of kids, followed them up, and we enrolled them at one month of age when they first came into the uh, postnatal clinic, and then followed them every month for the first year of life, and collected finger prick blood samples, and then through three years of age. Um, <clears throat> at the end, we had 150 kids with, I think, 1,800 data points, so a fairly robust study size. And I have to, um, this is just, uh, picture of a, one of the study participants with her child. This is my uh, graduate student who's now a faculty, um, Amolo, and then this is the research station in Kenya. So just to give you a sense that in Kenya now we have our own PCR machine, we have flow cytometer, we have a MagPix for doing an antibody, we have pretty much everything we need to do most of our exper uh, experiments there in Kenya. Um, we don't have that mass cytometer there yet, but we're gonna do that here. <laughs> um, so what we found when we did this study, and this actually wasn't what I was looking to find, I was just trying to understand when EBV infection occurred relative to malaria, but we found that the <coughs> kids in Kisumu were infected much earlier in life than the children in Nandi. So that shifted the age of primary EBV infection. And what's striking in either group though, in the US, most kids aren't infected until two to three years of age. There's this periodic, this shift between saliva transmission, you know, kids gumming and blah, blah all that, um, and then later on when the teenage years occur and saliva transmission begins again. <clears throat> in Kenya, all these kids are infected by the age of two. So none of them escape, there's no infectious mononucleosis that occurs in Africa. 
And what we found, we looked at the age of EBV infection. We also did EBV infection before six months of age. 35% of those kids were infected before six months of age. So very young age. And this is detection of EBV in the blood, right? So it's not um, it's confounded by antibody levels. It's actually viral detection. Um, the amount of virus we first detected between the, the two sites was no different, so the infection itself didn't change, right, um, between the two groups. But the log um, EBV time average area under the curve, so because I told you we had multiple time points that we could take, we do this area under the curve analysis so you can calculate all the viral load within that uh, amount. And actually, I don't know if I put his name down, but my biostatistician that I work with in, at Upstate, Rob Platt Snyder, um, I never actually, as a graduate student, I had a choice to take Spanish or biostat, so I took Spanish. Um, but but it's, been, it's been very helpful to work with a biostatistician who taught me quite a bit about it um, so that I can present and analyze this uh, very lovely data. I also then collaborated with a group um, at the University of New South Wales in Australia, Arnold Rinaldi, um, and his advisor, uh, Miles Davenport, are math modelers. So they took all that fancy data that we had um, and then squished it around and did some math modeling. And what they found was, um, <clears throat> because what we were originally doing was looking at what I call an ecological model of malaria exposure. Do the kids, they live in a malaria region, they don't live in a malaria region, so that's ecology. But we also had data on the parasitemia in these kids over time. So they, we also calculated that in, and what we found was, and you can't really see that, the time to EBV infection um, is much earlier in the Kasumu kids, but you get this, what we're seeing is these repeated uh, reactivation of the virus. So this viral load goes up and down, and it's more frequent, and it occurs more quickly um, in the kids from uh, Kasumu. So we have this rapid expansion. So um, EBV infection, there's a higher rate of viral expansion in uh, regions of high malaria uh, transmission. Longer duration of detectable EBV DNA as well, so the, the peaks between them are quite high. Um, and we've been trying to look at that data, and, and it won't, it's for a separate talk another time, but my student Nick Smith is following that up to understand if it's different or same viruses, and there's, there's a whole other story there um, with that, which I won't go into. So we know that, that EBV and malaria are interacting. It's driving this expansion of EBV-infected cells. There's more reactivation of the virus where there's more malaria. So it's really um, messing things up. But with the other piece that I mentioned is that EBV infects those kids before um, six months of age, 35%. And when you're less than six months of age and you're thinking about saliva transmission, um, <clears throat> there's not a lot of saliva exchange with little babies, mostly uh, you're not doing a lot of kiss space. That's not actually culturally relevant. I actually checked to see if that's um, what's happening. They're not, uh, mostly it's primarily breastfeeding within the population, so you're not getting um, pre-chewing of food. So <clears throat> it made us start thinking about what's going, we have to look at the mother. So I, I keep on going back further and further in time. So malaria um, is actually a really serious problem in pregnant women. Women in their first and second pregnancy in particular get what's called placental uh, malaria. And the parasite uh, invades the infected red blood cells, are able to invade the inner villa space in the placenta and uh, have severe problems on growth retardation, um, uh, early, uh, low birth weight, and um, loss of pregnancy, among other things. Um, it's also been shown that it, it, res it results in reduced transplacental transmission of maternal antibodies because, again, those antibodies have to cross the placenta and it's gummed up with infected red blood cells. So the study we then did is to focus on our area in Kisumu. And what we did this time, I was more bold, um, we enrolled mothers at the antenatal clinic when they first came into the, the local clinic um, we were able to screen because they had a provision of antiretroviral therapy and treatment for HIV to screen HIV positive versus HIV negative mothers. Um, and then we followed them all throughout their pregnancy at delivery and the mothers through the first 18 weeks postpartum. And then we followed those infants up for, for two years. And what we found out of 200 pregnant women enrolled, 175 were HIV negative. The sad fact right here, and I'm just going to bring this up, is that there was 25 mothers in that study that had never been diagnosed as HIV positive, and they were diagnosed the first time when they enrolled. There's a high rate of HIV transmission in this area, and that's um, studies for another day, too, as well. So <clears throat> what we found, uh, my student, Ibrahim Daoud, um, 
uh, looked at uh, malaria in, during pregnancy in the different mothers and found 54% um, of them were malaria positive at any given time during pregnancy. And these mothers are actually, so that the bad news is they're also getting uh, intermittent prevention for treatment of malaria. So they're actually getting anti-malarial drugs, but it looks like resistance is occurring. And EBV viral load was higher in women that were malaria infected, and there was a significant positive association. So increases in viral load correlated with increase, increases in EBV load. So these mothers um, are infected with EBV, and the parasite is affecting that persistence of the virus. We next looked at um, EBV antibodies. This is a subset of the kids, and I'm just uh, with placental malaria positive versus ones that were placental malaria negative, and this was work done by my student now postdoc, Sydney Ogola, who's here. Um, and when we think about those antibodies coming across um, and into the infant, if you then look at the cord blood, you can compare what's in the cord blood versus what's in the maternal blood. But what we saw was a significant decrease in antibodies against two um, EBV proteins, the viral capsid antigen and EBNA1, in those children born to mothers that had placental malaria. So it's blocking transmission of those EBV antibodies. <clears throat> Then, as I told you, we're thinking about how is this virus transmitted so early in life, right? How can it get there? So the next thing we wanted to do, and there was one report of one study that found breast milk somewhere, somewhere. So I thought, well, we should look at the breast milk and see what's there. And so um, this work that Ibrahim did, and EBV DNA prevalence, so we looked at the mothers. We had breast milk samples at 6, 10, 14, and 18 weeks postpartum. And then what you could see at six weeks, over 60% of the mothers, you could detect virus by PCR in the, um, in the breast milk. And of the ones, the mothers that were PCR positive, the, the viral load was actually quite higher at six weeks and declined um, over time as well. But again, quite, quite high viral load. And then if we looked at the mothers that had malaria during uh, delivery, um, they were the ones that also had the highest EBV viral load. So a correlation with that as well. <clears throat> We next wanted to look and say, well, you can pick up viral DNA in, in, the, in the breast milk, but it could be due to lice cells, something else. So we wanted to see if it was infectious virus. So the first thing we did is we took some breast milk samples and we treated it with DNAs. The virus is encapsidated, so if you treat it with DNAs and then inactivate that DNAs, you should get rid of any free-floating DNA from uh, latently infected cells. When we did that, um, what we found is that um, quite a number of them, I, Let's see, N and 40. Uh, 21 of 40 were still uh, EBV PCR positive. Same, we have infectious virions in that breast milk. And then to further follow up on that, and this is work done by uh, Carrie Coleman, my postdoc in the lab, um, we then tried to transform. I told you that EBV immortalizes B cells in culture. So when you put the virus on B cells, EBV type 1 virus, it drives those cells to proliferate rapidly, so you can make uh, long-term B cell lines out of that. And so we were able to, um, we took breast milk and incubated it with PBMCs from uh, um, healthy donors. And out of 10 of the 20 samples, we were able to generate um, transformed cell lines, and we actually had infectious virus in the breast milk. So we think that the breast milk might be a source of transmission, and malaria plays a role in having more virus shed in the breast milk um, as well. So. <clears throat> to summarize, then, um, if we think about what malaria is doing, that's an infected red blood cell there, so it's sort of their model for malaria. Um, it affects the mothers during pregnancy. Um, it reduces transplacental transfer of antibodies, shedding of a virus in the breast milk. We think that leads to that early age of EBV infection. Early age of EBV infection leads to more viral reactivation. Um, it also, um, what did I have here? And you, Again, we have the repeated infections during life, high number of latently infected cells. So we have this high viral load in these kids, one in 1,000, one in 10,000 um, PBMCs are EBV positive. That still doesn't get at the question of where, how do we go from there to there, right? What's that next step going along that, that pathway? Um, and what we have to come back to is thinking about the key feature of Burkitt's lymphoma is that CMIC translocation. The CMIC translocation, again, is the MIC oncogene translocated onto the immunoglobulin across the chromosomal translocation. And it's actually been shown in mouse models, mouse model by Michelle Nussenbeig, and I'll show you a little bit more data from his group, that the enzyme activation-induced deaminase, or AID, can induce that in a mouse model. AID is an important enzyme in B cells. Um, it's involved with somatic hypermutation and class switching. So it's a very important um, enzyme, but it looks like it might get dysregulated. <clears throat> 
There's also a study by a group at UCLA that showed that um, levels of AID increased in the peripheral blood prior to the emergence of non-Hodgkin lymphoma in AIDS patients. So some sense that there might be dysregulation with that. So we started, we wanted to look at what was going on with AID in um, both in our kids in the study and, and um, also in the lab. So my uh, student, uh, Joel Wilmore, um, uh, did this study with samples from our, our Kasumo and Nandi children, and he looked at PBMC isolated from those kids and just detected, just asked, is AID detected, just like they saw in the, in the NHL study. Um, and this is just a viral load. It's, it's uh, copies, not viral load, sorry, copies of AID per 5 times 10 to the 5th PBMC. And the kids from Kasumo, the malaria high, Burkitt lymphoma high, had significantly higher levels of AID positive cells compared to the NANDI positive, NANDI children, where there's very little malaria. The next step in the study, which is actually the grant that I didn't get, but I'm going to try again, um, is to look at AID in those kids and localize it to the EBV infected cells. We didn't get there yet, but that's, that's sort of next up. But that's suggestive that where there's more malaria, there's more AID positive B cells. And again, these are healthy kids. These are all very healthy kids. Joel also did a study, because you can't do any of this work without having a little bit of mouse work involved. Um, <clears throat> and what he did is he uh, had a, a reporter mouse that expresses AID, so it's AID GFP positive. And so it takes AID um, regulatory region upstream of GFP. So you can use GFP as a marker for AID activation. And so what we did is we took a, um, mice and infected them with a mouse malaria, Plasmodium shibati, and we infected those and then looked at AID expression in different B cell subsets. And so he uh, sorted them on, looks very faint from here, transitional one, two, and three B cell subsets, um, also germinal center B cells, marginal zone, and I can't even see it from here, but another B cell subset, mature B cell subset, and then looked for AID expression um, relative to that. So it's not so surprising that you would find AID in germinal center B cells because that's what you're exposed to see. Germinal center B cells induce AID. That's where somatic hyperimmutation class switching is occurring. And um, you can see these are the GFP positive cells here. He also infected with, so he infected the mice with um, uninfected red blood cells, control RBCs, or plasmodium infected red blood cells. But you can see this vary in the, in the germinal center striking uh, level of, of AID positive. But what we also see is that AID is turned on in the marginal zone uh, B cells and also in uh, transitional B cells. So it suggests that during an acute malaria infection, it's a, a dysregulation of AID expression. Now, what we didn't do, and I'm presenting data from uh, Neusenweig's group, is that I had wanted to study, one of the reasons I was studying the mouse model is that I wanted to do this repeated infection, and I didn't realize I wasn't thinking about the immune system and that you, it creates sterilizing immunity. Well, Neusenweig didn't care about that, so he just repeatedly infected the mice, even though it wasn't causing disease. I'm like, oh, I wish I would have thought of that. But um, what he did is he infected mice that were AID minus or AID positive, so he knocked out AID, so that's one thing. But he also had to knock out P53. When he did that, he found that these mice developed these lymphomas, this is the AID positive P53 minus mice, 100% um, of the time. What you'll notice though, I'll just put a caveat to this study, is that this is, this is out to 70 weeks. It's a long time before they um, all succumb to lymphoma development. But it's a very nice proof of principle that plasmodium, repeated plasmodium infections, what he also didn't put in his paper is how many times he repeated any of the details of the infection, but repeated plasmodium infections um, were linked to uh, lymphoma development. So it's a beautiful uh, study with that um, model system. But he didn't try to understand that, well, he hasn't published on trying to understand why we're getting that lymphoma development yet. So, and the other piece is that in Burkitt's lymphoma, EBV is always in those tumor cells. So EBV has to play a role in this. We think about that virus. So how does EBV fit into that? Well, <clears throat> there's a story, that another piece in the puzzle is an enzyme called B-cell activation factor, or also known as BLIS. The BAF is upregulated during acute infections. It drives transitional uh, B-cells out of the bone marrow, um, enhanced number of B-cells during an infection. And it also, there was this small little paper that it might be linked to AID. So we just did a first study um, <clears throat> to look at children with acute malaria and post-recovery and found in the plasma that there's very high levels of BAF induced during acute malaria. So these kids with malaria have lots of BAF. This is actually in uh, 
nanograms per mil, um, so quite a bit there. And then we did another experiment, and this was done by Carrie Coleman in the lab. So she took PBMC, infected with EBV, waited for five, day, uh, five days, and then evaluated the CD19-positive BAF receptor-positive cells. Um, and what you can see here, the mock infected is in red. It's just this sharp peak right here. And then we infected with two different strains of EBV, but what you can see is a clear upregulation of the BAF receptor when EBV infects those B cells. So now we know that BAF goes up during acute malaria, EBV induces the BAF receptor on those B cells. And then, ta-da, um, we did a next experiment with EBV, BAF, and IL-4. IL-4 is also increased during uh, acute malaria um, as well. We didn't do the data on it in our study, but others have shown that. And so we did mock infected versus EBV infected um, with or without IL-4, BAF, or IL-4 and BAF. And then um, through the kindness of Ed Janoff, who had got this technique to work, we had tried to get this to work years ago, but in his lab, and I can't think of who it was that did that, but one of his people that worked with him uh, got this protocol working. You can see here, this is the level of AID positive cells in the different populations. So none of these by themselves um, induce AID. EBV alone will induce some AID, and that's been shown. There's two uh, EBV LMP1, late membrane protein 1 can upregulate AID. If you add IL-4, it goes from 16% to 19%, so not much higher. Um, if you add BAF, it goes up to 29% of the cells now become AID positive. And then if you add BAF and IL-4 together, plus EBV, it's 36% of them are AID positive. So it really implies that there's a synergism of activation going on. The next steps we have to look at is, is really getting at the AID and looking at the functional activation. This is just an expression um, that we can detect the protein, but we want to try to get at it more mechanistically. And then this last piece here, this is data from uh, Mar um, Martin Alde in England in his postdoc. Um, and what they were looking at, and I just bring this up to, uh, to remind myself, so one of the things I keep on coming back is, why does high EBV viral load matter, right? Why do we care about these kids that have this high number of EBV positive cells? We know that AID can be induced in them, but one of the things that happens is, is that EBV induces um, the dimethyltransferase. What they found that this BIM protein, which is a BH3 only BCL2 homolog, it's a pro-apoptotic gene, is actually down, um, um, methylated, so it's not functional um, in both in Burkitt lymphoma cell lines and also um, uh, mostly in, in BL lines. So it suggests that um, when EBV infects those B cells just to begin with and drives that expansion, and then the viral proteins are shut down, but once that viral protein is expressed, it methylates those cells, and that's one of the things we'd like to get at in, the, in our samples from Kenya, but it's very difficult, again, and now with the new technology uh, where we can do things on very little cells, I think we can be able to get at this question. But we hypothesize that those virally infected cells have been um, epigenetically modified by the viral infection so that if CMYK gets overexpressed in them, they're less susceptible to die by apoptosis. Overexpression of CMYK in a healthy B cell will actually cause those B cells to um, apoptose and, and get turned off. So CMYK regulation in a healthy B cell is actually very tightly regulated. So what I've shown you then is thinking about what malaria does um, during pregnancy, early on in infection. And then lastly, um, malaria induces the AID via BAF TLR9. Um, actually, I didn't show you that part, um, but it does. Uh, increased expression of AID in children that are EBV viral load positive from the malaria high level. So they've got a lot of AID positive cells. We think those cells, based on the work of others, are resistant to apoptosis and makes those AID positive cells susceptible to that CMYK translocation. And I think when I came at this study, when I was first doing this, so I'm, I'm trained in biochemistry, molecular biology, and then went into an epidemiology department, I had a very uh, linear view of what malaria did, did to B cells, right? And I was thinking about it, it activates the B cells, suppresses T cell responses. But what we think about with an infection like this, this is a life course event. It affects the mothers, it affects the infants. It's this repeated infection with this parasite that makes it very unique and increases that susceptibility. So for anybody in this room, sometimes people have asked me, well, if I go and get malaria, will I get cancer? Uh, most people, I hope, are smart enough only to get malaria once if you survive it. Um, you'll definitely take your prophylactic drugs the next time. So most people only get 
uh, travelers will get it once. So it's not a once infection, it's the repeated infection, this chronicity of that exposure that drives that risk. So uh, in 2011, I had the opportunity to go to the International Agency IARC for Research in Cancer in Lyon. Um, the food was fabulous, the work was incredibly hard. They bring people together every year on these working groups to evaluate cancer risk of different agents. Um, and they identify cancer risk as group one, two A, three, and four. And a group one agent is carcinogenic in humans. EBV is considered a, a group one carcinogen, so um, they've evaluated that there was a conclusion. Two A is it's probably carcinogenic, two B is it's um, possibly carcinogenic. And so <clears throat> we, we spent a lot of time in that week evaluating all the data, trying to get at this. And the evaluation was that uh, malaria was uh, caused by infections with plasmodium falciparum and whole endemic areas was probably carcinogenic, so group 2A. However, what I would argue is at the time, we didn't have the animal data that Newsom Vigas showed, and we didn't have the mechanistic data linking AID with that. So I, would, I suspect, if we're going to have this meeting again, we would consider that malaria is also a class one carcinogen because it brings the other pieces in. Prior to this, we didn't have, the epidemiologic studies were very challenging because um, malaria is everywhere within a population, so it's hard to get exposed and not exposed. So I hope I've convinced you that malaria is a possible, probable, uh, actually group one carcinogen, I think it is. Um, there's also some evidence right now that there is malaria linked to another uh, a virus associated cancer, Kaposi sarcoma, and that's data out of Uganda. So the question now is we're going to go back and look and collaborate with a group in Uganda and at NCI to begin to understand if there's something going on between malaria and KSHV, Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus. So at the end of the day, when we study cancer, um, you know, we can think about the mechanism, we can think about the epidemiology, but we all would like to prevent cancer. When I had started this project, I thought that EBV would be a good target for the vaccine. There's a big effort at NCI, not, maybe not big enough, but um, to develop an a, a EBV vaccine. Our data suggests to me that it's going to be very hard to vaccinate children because that infection occurs so early. Maybe we could vaccinate the moms, I'm not sure, um, the cost effectiveness. But it really made me think about malaria and switching the focus over to malaria prevention. And this is um, data from the Malaria Atlas Project, and this just shows the the darker colors, the higher intensity of malaria transmission looks just like that lymphoma belt from Dennis Burkett from way back when. And this is the, the map right now in 2015 with all the interventions that have been going on with malaria, um, bed nets, uh, prophylactic drugs, artemisinin. And so the incidence has reduced quite a bit. And what we'd like to ask next is whether this um, reduction in malaria transmission actually leads to reduction in Burkitt lymphoma and making a very clear link between um, uh, sort of can you intervene in malaria transmission to reduce the cancer incidence. So I'd like to think there's a number of people that have worked on this project over the years, especially at Kemri. My, my graduate students, I've trained actually five PhD students in Kenya. They've all contributed. Sydney, Ibrahim, Odada, Amolo. Um, actually, and I, Eunice is there, but that's a separate study. Um, especially the study participants and their families who've worked very hard um, working with us to provide us the samples that we need and our clinical staff and field assistants. Um, here at the University of Colorado, in particular, I talk about the work of Carrie Coleman um, and others in my group, and Sydney's actually here right now uh, doing his postdoc with me. At SUNY Upstate, my, I talked about the work of Joel Wilmore and Eric Wolford, um, who got their PhDs with me and are now off doing cool B cell stuff and pediatrics, and then at New South Wales as well. So those are pictures of kids with, uh, we went to Kenya. They're all children with Burkitt's lymphoma. My husband uh, had very expensive $150 glasses. That's the cost to treat one child for Burkitt lymphoma. So it, it's a good reminder of that. They were having a great giggle, though, looking at themselves with the sunglasses on. So I'll take any questions. Mm -hmm. They're also a common thing they all have in common if they all have some level of inflammation. The, the EVB induced inflammation? No, no, the, right. the, 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 and, causes of agents. And mm -hmm. It's common with a lot of other viral cancers, so right. HPV and cervical carcinoma. You know, other uh, venereal diseases are highly associated with cervical carcinoma. Right. right. 
Right. I think that's, I mean, so the role of inflammation in cancer, if you think about the BAF, IL-4, sort of that systemic inflammation, um, and also the uh, pattern recognition receptors upregulate with malaria. We haven't looked specifically at that, so I, I didn't bring that point in, sort of thinking about inflammatory markers. Certainly within that splenic environment and the lymph nodes, it's got to be a, a lot, large level of inflammation in there, but it's a good point. Could I ask you follow-up? Yeah. So the sickle cell trait, you know, if you're, if you're heterozygous for it, I think the malaria, you're, you're still infected with malaria. Right. But the course of the disease is very different. They don't have the severity of it. So, so, so with sickle cell, so sickle cell is a, a hemoglobinopathy. It's about 20% in this population. The, the, the heterozygous, the, the homozygous, the sicklers uh, usually don't survive. So we'll put them out of the, the question. So there's been a, several studies that have looked at that. Um, one by Ann Mormon, who um, has looked at that. The, epi, the epidemiologic data is not convincing. She, uh, in her study based in Kenya, said that there was no correlation. Another study based in Uganda said there was, but I don't think the study has been designed appropriately to do that. But with sickle cell, the parasite can infect those red blood cells, but you don't get that high level of parasitemia, so you don't get quite as sick with it. Um, but there are kids with sickle cell trait that get Burkitt's lymphoma, so it might not be quite there with that. Roberta? Right. So that so trying to look at the levels of translocation, actually we'd, we, we'd put that in a grant to try to do that. And the problem with the semic translocations is they occur over such large uh, uh, spans. So trying to PCR amplify them up, and again from a little bit of blood from kids. Now we did this in 2009, 2008, so it's been a while since we tried to get at that question. I think we'd, I'd like to go back with better uh, technology, but there's evidence in other non-Hodgkin's lymphomas that you can pick up uh, circulating trans cells with translocations. This was a BCL6 and follicular lymphoma. But I think that's a great question. Can we detect higher frequency of these um, pre-malignant cells is what I like to call them. Right. Yeah, Jill? Um, the Burkitt's lymphoma, they can get a, a, a sporadic Burkitt's lymphoma as they age, but that, as the older lymphoma doesn't seem to be EBV associated. So this EBV positive endemic form of the Burkitt's is really age dependent. And I might just say, coming back to your inflammation question, the um, jaw tumors, they actually show that they come out the nidus of uh, tooth buds, developing tooth buds. So sites of inflammation, um, young girls, when they're developing breasts, they get breast, uh, the, the tumors are there. So it might be that those B cells go to a site of inflammation and, and drive that. I don't know why, um, but malaria also sort of wanes off and your immunity comes into play as well as you age out. So it might be linked to the um, less frequency of, of malaria disease, not, not infection, but disease. Any other questions? All right, thank you, everybody.